What's up? <coughs> what? <Good. laughs> Being yourself on camera is hard. It's harder than I, I thought it would be. Hello, I'm Julian, and I sing in a band from Canada called Inhalants. And today we're going to be talking about this synthesizer that I'm wasting all my money trying to build. <laughs> Last time I did a video, somebody in the comments said I act like I hate talking to the camera, so I'm gonna try to work on that this time. So we're a punk band from Canada that uses an old Game Boy from the 1980s as a synthesizer and an instrument. It's kind of our fifth member. It's a lot more reliable than the other four members. So essentially, this guy, Johan Kutlinski, has been working on this software called LSDJ for the Game Boy for like the last 20 years. It's a custom software that you load onto the Game Boy and it's a sequencer. So if you don't know how a sequencer works, it just lets you program the notes and then it plays it back for you. There we go, it got to focus. So this is all the programming for it. It's just text-based and it plays back the audio that you program. So you can design the sound wave and uh, and program all the note changes and everything in it like that. So if you're wondering why anyone would use an old Game Boy from the 80s as an instrument, the artifacts that come from using this old processor are pretty unique and it has a very distinct sound because uh, it only uses 8-bit audio. If you're interested more in the specifics of how this sound chip works, I did a video for it up here, I guess you can see. So in our case, the Game Boy plays a backing track into our drummer's ears. His name's Jordan, uh, so he can hear how the song goes. And then it also plays leads out of the main PA speakers on stage, where the vocals come out of. And then it also actually plugs into my bass amp uh, and takes over bass duty for me sometimes when we play live. So some songs, I actually don't play bass at all, and it's purely synth bass, and it goes into my bass amplifier so it sounds like an actual bass guitar, which is pretty cool. It's a, it's a pretty unique sound. The problem with that setup is it's pretty elaborate. There's a lot of cables and stuff that needs to be plugged in. It goes into the effects processor and a separate mixer, and then I have to plug in power and connect to my guitar and the amp and the pedals and all this other stuff. So a lot of the time when we play short sets, our setup time takes as long or longer than our actual set, which is really annoying and leads to a lot of problems. For example, in 2019, the second greatest band in the world, The Armed, They were gracious enough to let us play their No Rest Fest in Detroit. We were on for like a 10 minute set. That's what we were supposed to play, just like all the other bands. But I drove three days up from Texas to Ontario, and then I drove another six hours from Ontario to Detroit with the band, just so we could go play that 10 minute set. And it took us so long to set up that we had to go over our set time. So the drummer actually threw a, a bottle at me before we started our last song. <laughs> I don't think they're gonna let us play again. Even though this guy on Reddit said that we're basically a hidden boss, they probably weren't too pleased that we went over time, but whatever. So that kind of problem has made me want some kind of like one-off custom bespoke synthesizer that was suited exactly to our needs, specifically for our songs, because it's pretty idiosyncratic. And also I wanted something that would reduce our setup time to the bare minimum. So I want to plug in as few things as possible. I want as few points of failure. Having a bunch of things to plug in and out doesn't just take a long time. It also means that if I do have an issue on stage, which happens a lot, it's really difficult to find out what the problem is because there's so many different things that could be going wrong. So that's definitely ruined a few shows, especially when a lot of our new songs 
are basically unplayable without the Game Boy. So two years ago, I started building a prototype for this project. It was a much more simple design, and I basically ripped off the aesthetic of classic Moog synthesizers like the uh, Mini Moog and then the Moog subsequent. I actually got some parts cut and I got pretty far with it before I realized it wasn't designed properly. And I have a huge backlog of footage from building those components. So here I mounted the Game Boy on the actual plate. This controls the screen contrast and the Game Boy works. And I was designing all this stuff behind. But one thing I realized was that stacking up footage that way and then trying to go through and edit like four or five episodes after I'm way past that old point in the project I realized that that's a really bad strategy because first of all, I forget what my state of mind was and the problems I was solving at the time. And then it's also unmanageable from an editing perspective because I have to go through and rewatch all this stuff rather than having it fresh in my memory. Normally when I edit a video, I just recorded it or I've been working on it for the last few days. And then it's all fresh in my mind. So I understand what everything is, but when it happened, you know, a month and a half ago, I have to basically re-experience that whole day and sit through all of the footage. So I'm trying to be disciplined with releasing videos as they're relevant to the project. So I'm, I'm working and then I'm releasing a video and I'm not going to move on to the next part of the project until I've done that video. Regardless of those editing issues and, and logistical stuff, that design wasn't sufficient functionally and it wasn't sufficient aesthetically. It wasn't striking enough. I want the thing itself to be a real piece of art on its own beyond just what it does. That was just a prototype to see what I would need to actually have done in the final design. Uh, and I feel like I learned a lot of that from, from that prototype design. So probably the biggest issue with the last one was that I didn't do enough planning. I left so many things up to the actual assembly process that it got really discouraging. I didn't really plan how I was going to join everything together. I didn't plan how I was going to screw everything in place and how the weight was going to be oriented. And I didn't plan for enough space for all the internal components just because I didn't want to build a 3D model of a power strip and then put that inside. I just made a lot of guesses and that ended up being so frustrating that I just didn't want to build it anymore because I just kept fucking my future self in the design process. I also underestimated the scope of this. It's by far the most elaborate build project I've ever done. And with that prototype, I don't think my design or engineering skills were up to par. But since then, I've done a lot of learning. Obviously, I'm still going to make a lot of mistakes, but I think right now I'm up to the challenge of actually building this thing in part because of my two design philosophies for everything. My two main commitments in this whole design is one, plan everything, and two, design in a way that allows for things you didn't plan. So that means there's a lot of extra space in here and the design is pretty modular. Like all the components and all the electronics are built on this plate system, like I was doing on the old one. That was a good idea. So I really wanted to make something that was consistent with the design language of the old Nintendo products, like the original Nintendo and the Game Boy. Also, I found that that was really similar to a lot of the 80s sci-fi props used in a lot of the movies, like Alien. So the design for this was very heavily inspired by the mother computer from the first Alien movie. And then uh, also old computers from that time. There's something just about that 80s future aesthetic that I think is so fucking cool. And I think it's a distinct enough look that it resonates with people. Like CRT TVs and stuff like that are really uh, a pretty iconic imagery that we don't get to see anymore. I wanted something that looked like it could have been made in the 80s, and I think I pretty well nailed the aesthetic, at least in the 3D model. So it's comprised of a few separate sections. There's a display in the middle that will show the output from the Game Boy screen. That way I can see it from across the stage. And then the main control surface right here is the NES Advantage arcade stick. It's a peripheral for the old Nintendo console, um, like the original one and it just gave you like arcade style controls, but I'll be using it to actually control the Game Boy so that I don't have to be using thumbs or have a separate connected controller. Half the reason for using it is just because it looks sweet. On the right side here is the main source of sound. So it's just the Game Boy on a removable faceplate. 
and then it has some outboard controls so I can uh, adjust things related to the Game Boy. There's a power reset switch and stuff. And like I said, I left a lot of extra space inside the whole thing because no matter how much planning I do, there's always going to be things I didn't account for and components that need to be included that I didn't think of in advance. And I'm only going to realize a lot of that stuff when I'm actually building it or when I'm actually trying to use it. And I know for sure in the future, I'm going to have more stupid ideas that I want to include. Uh, so I'm trying to prep myself for that and, and make it something that I can continue to develop as time goes on. Anyway, below the Game Boy module, there's a patch bay and a mixer. I decided to have 100% of the signal routing be external. So it's going to be connected through just quarter inch jacks plugged in and out. So this whole side is going to be a rat's nest of cables, which in part, again, will probably look really cool. But also it means that I can troubleshoot this stuff really simply. So I don't have to open anything if there's an issue with the signal routing or a grounding loop or something like that. And one big thing I'm trying to prevent here is if a single component fails, I want to have a backup one that I can just plug into the face of the of the console. So for example, if the Game Boy fails, because all of the connections on that are external, I can just pull the cartridge out of the console and then plug it into my backup Game Boy. And then I can just plug those three into the place. So it just means I have a lot more flexibility and uh, a lot more access to everything that's going on in the system just from this patch bay. So I'm hoping that it'll mitigate some of the issues where we have a single component fail. Uh, if I need to, I can easily bypass the effects processor by just unplugging it from the front and plugging it straight into the mixer instead of having the signal go through the effects processor. So hopefully this will help me deal with problems that inevitably come up. And then down below the patch bay are some mixer controls and then those buttons on either side are just power reset switches for the various components. And then this is cool. So underneath the display, it looks like there's controls for the display. The whole thing is based on these old Sony PVM CRTs. Uh, I was really trying to channel that aesthetic for the, the main display portion, but those controls are actually the front of my bass amplifier. So my bass amp is actually going to be in here because like I was saying earlier, sometimes the Game Boy plays bass. It also means that I have one single power supply for everything. So it's all going to be a single power cable powering my guitar, the pedals, and the whole synth and the amp. And that should also solve a lot of ground loop issues that we've had. With and then the biggest addition to this that I think is going to be the biggest headache remover is the Game Boy has a link cable. You would use that to trade Pokemon or some games had like a multiplayer feature or something like that. Um, but this software that I use, LSDJ, it uh, actually lets you send MIDI data over the link cable, which means you can instruct and program other devices using the song programming in the LSDJ song. And it's all controlled by the Game Boy. It's all synced to the master clock in the Game Boy. So everything's in time. Now that's amazing because it means I can control the effects processor. So I can switch effects if I want to switch to reverb or delay or like a low frequency oscillator. Or if I want to actually control the effects processor as its own synthesizer, I can do that all from the Game Boy without having to touch it at all. I can send instructions to a visualizer or our light show, which is gonna be the first application of this MIDI functionality. And then also, instead of using a foot switch to switch between my bass guitar or the Game Boy, the Game Boy can actually switch instruments for me. Like it can mechanically switch from my guitar to itself playing bass into my amp because I have this MIDI controlled a B selector, which is really cool. I'm pretty excited about that. It means I never have to think about, okay, which instrument is playing when I never have to make the mistake of going to play bass and realizing I forgot to switch back to the guitar from the Game Boy. Uh, so I'm thinking that's going to solve a lot of problems so far. This has actually been like two months of full-time design work. I'm actually forcibly unemployed right now because of my immigration processing. I got married and I'm trying to get a green card and stuff. Suffice to say, I have a lot of time and I'm not allowed to do anything responsible. So I'm spending all that time on ridiculous projects like this, but because I'm integrating so many pre-built components, like pretty much everything is 
a product that was designed by somebody else and I'm just integrating them all. That means I have to design around all of that stuff. And I also had to reverse engineer every single component to a 10th of a millimeter. So that's really tedious and actually pretty difficult, especially when components have like rounded edges and stuff like that. Everything has to line up perfectly in order for the design to work. And in order for me to be able to make these plates and uh, have them mountable by the normal screws on the component I'm using, that stuff was really difficult. And for example, this is the effects processor. This is a really popular device. You've if you know anything about synths, you've probably seen this before. It's called a chaos pad, but it's about two inches, well, one and a half inches thick. And I didn't want it just rising off the top of the console. So in order for it to actually get integrated properly into the synthesizer, I had to take it to a CNC milling place and get this whole edge ground down with a, a mill but fortunately the shape of it was such that we were able to do that without extreme difficulty. And also I had to really think through the way the signal routing is gonna go. I'll give you an example of the block diagram. This is the routing of all of the components in the direction that they're routed with all of the correct connections. So it took me a long time to figure out how this stuff was gonna be oriented and to sort it out in my brain and there's a lot of separate devices that I had to integrate like isolators and all this stuff so that I have no issues at all. So I think it'll actually be pretty interesting. I'm really proud of the work that I've done so far. I really committed to learning everything instead of just coming up with workarounds. So uh, this has been a huge learning experience. The downside of learning while I'm doing this is the project is just a mess. Uh, anybody who's actually experienced with Fusion would just be fucking embarrassed by the amount of different components that I have that aren't actually in the real design. And it's really, it's really bogging down my computer at this point, but this is obviously really elaborate and I'm learning a lot about design as I go through it. One huge issue I ran into the other day and this sucked was I was originally going to build it all out of half inch thick, high density polyethylene plastic. It's like cutting board material. And I didn't start thinking about the material considerations until I was basically done with the design, like an idiot. First of all, without any components, if I did this all in plastic, it would be like more than a hundred pounds. And that's not including any of the hardware that's actually gonna go in it. Also, you can't paint HDPE in a way that will stay. So I wouldn't be able to get the aesthetic that I wanted, like an old computer. So. I'm going to have to go back to wood is what I'm thinking right now. I'm still doing some research on materials, but I'm probably going to have to go back to wood so I can still get some strength and have it be lighter, still machinable, uh, but also paintable and finishable so I can get it to a nice finish. The cool thing about wood is if you finish it properly, you can make it look like it's not wood. So for example, this guitar, you can't tell that it's wood. It could very easily just be like a hollow piece of plastic or or something like that. Um, and that's the finish that I'm trying to go for is I, I really want it to look like an old computer. Anyway, uh, that's about it. I think I've gone on long enough, but hopefully this is interesting. I'm gonna do probably two to three more videos about my design choices and uh, the specifics of what's going on with this thing. And then I'm gonna have the parts cut and uh, we'll go through the build process together. So uh, if you're interested, subscribe. And if you've got any questions or any advice also would be good. Specifically, if anyone has any ideas about what materials I can use, right now this is designed for half inch. If I go to Baltic Birch Plywood, I have to adjust all of the measurements by I think 0.3 millimeters, which is gonna be really annoying and really tedious. I need something that I can machine on a CNC and cut out of a single sheet that is rigid enough to be a structural piece like wood, is paintable and uh, isn't heavier than Baltic birch plywood. So if you do have any ideas or suggestions, that would be a huge help because I'm a novice at this. I don't have an engineering background. But for now I have to shoot all the B-roll and then I gotta pack because tomorrow I leave for a trip for Hawaii. So. <laughs> I'm still getting nervous uh, talking to the camera as if it's other people. 
I'm used to filming stuff. I went to film school, but this is still weird. So I'm just gonna pretend that you're people, even though I'm staring at my camera in my room alone right now. My name's Julian, and I play in Inhalants. I'll see you fuckers in the next episode.